Um, welcome to the broadcast, everybody coming in. Welcome, welcome. For all of you coming in, if you are on a new account, be sure to verify your email address so that you can type in the chat to ask questions. Word. Because that's important, yes. That is questions. what makes this great, is being able to live talk directly. interact. What's up, Wolf? Okay, Be, being Bina. able to talk directly to the author is what makes it amazing. Well, yes. at least ask a question, we can relay it, because I, I don't know if he's I'm going not sure to actively he's watch, watch the broadcast. watch the broadcast and see the questions, but at least, you know, we'll relay if he's not. Because sometimes that's a little bit much for everybody to deal with yeah, when they only have one screen. Mm -hmm. It gets to be a pain. Not everybody's got, you know, screens all over the place, so. How old is Mark? I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure. That's either. a good question, and we'll ask him when he gets here. How about that? Wolf? <laughs> <coughs> well, give us a little up. bit of give us a rundown of the uh, stories there, hon. So, brain trust. These this is people who want to solve real problems, and the governments, well, and the corporations of the world, they don't really want to solve problems. They want money. And so the Brain Trust is trying to solve real-world problems, real problems. You know, power, energy, food. With as many people as we have on this planet, it's, it's going to be very soon that we can't grow enough to sustain easily. And we're going to have to, you know, think of better What's ways up, to produce. And so that's a lot of what Brain Trust talks about is, is what they can do. You know, these people come up with ideas and they hash them out and make and even make whole new companies about these things and really solve problems <laughs> no we're not doing infinity <laughs> well you're right you're right you're right the infinity stone <coughs> would solve the population crisis damn it yeah like this yeah good point it's a very good point um but knowing you know knowing how the universe is all always intertwined Somehow Q would just put it all back anyway, so that's all I can say. <laughs> not even the same universe, but right, I guess Q can travel to all universes. Did you universes, not just so. hear me say yeah, 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 all yeah. the universes intertwine? Except for the Marvel Universe, it doesn't. Thanos was <laughs> Thanos was the hero of the movie. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome back, back Z Money. Z -Money. Well, Thanos, Thanos, you should read the comic books. Thanos really is the hero of the story, even though he is the villain of the story as well. well they actually had to get Thanos hard to stop uh, uh, um, Gamora. Gamora? Is that her name? The no. green chick? Yes, the green chick. I'm Emerald Storm Z-Money. Oh, I would have to... Uh, I, okay. Oh, I'm yeah, I agree, Sheba. So far, I've loved what Josh Brolin did with the character. I started watching um, Venom, last, Venom night. last night. I watched the in, I watched it all the way. I liked it. They did really good with it to me. I you mean, didn't like it. I all I can tell you is, quit being so picky, because it was great. It was humorous. It what's up, Betty? Really like deep in some parts, deeper than I really expected it to be. Actually. Mm-hmm. Because I've never seen Venom portrayed with that depth, ever. Well, I, I fell asleep within the first ten minutes. And that might have had something to do with me just being tired and not the movie being it, boring. It was already like, you put that on at like six o'clock in the morning, honey. Seven. Oh, you watched Seven. it all the way through? Yeah, I told you I didn't go to bed until ten or eleven. You were too hyped up. No, every time I laid down, I'd start coughing. Oh, boo. I would get just right, and, you know, you just start to drift off, and then a fucking coughing fit would hit me. Yuck. And I, so I just got back up for several hours and then drank some of that throat coat tea, and it upset my stomach reflux, mm -hmm. and so I had to eat some Tums, and then I was finally able to lay down. Well, but. there you go. Well, do you guys want to get... Are you ready for Mark? Anybody ready for Mark? What did, you made a this? bunch of sample caster badges after Meek said people were complaining. What are they complaining about? That's disappointing. You and Luxie should just be here. Th Luxie right? would Luxie like would this. like this. Where is my Luxie? Tell him he would like this. 
<laughs> oh, the caster badge style? Look, Sheba, I warned them before they ever passed that out. It does. And I told them that before they ever gave them to us. You DM'd me the images? Okay, let me look. Number nine is the most popular so far. Wait, are you re... Oh, yeah. Are you reinventing the caster badges? Well, I told them before they ever gave them to us when we saw that email. <laughs> Straight up, Nick relayed the message. It looks like the D-Live Lemon. No, it looks like the D-Live Money. I actually like... Lo I like number nine or number 12 or 14. Yeah. Well... Yeah, any one of those. Any one that's not yellow. 14. Yeah, I don't think... I mean, the cut, the yellow I did pops. watch that little boy playing guitar. He does pretty good. Not bad for a little wee one. For a wee lad. He was playing the guitar? Uh, I Eddie sent me a video of this uh, little boy playing uh, Nothing Else Matters. Oh, I've seen this kid do that. Are you talking about the kid that got up on stage with Metallica? No, he was oh, sitting... Uh, he was just doing it on an acoustic guitar. I haven't seen one do it on an acoustic. King, do I have to put you back on pause, man? <laughs> it's close enough that it makes a resemblance enough that it cha that Agreed. people's minds. Well, you're not right. It looks like the D Live Lemon. It, it reminds it, me. The color may be slightly different, but it is a. It enough. reminds me of the, when I first saw it. My immediate thought was D Live Lemon. So, and sorry. pretty much everybody else thought the same thing. So, mind you, have a hex nut. nut. Well, see, I think I I like I like fourteen up, and I like nine. So, all right. Without uh, further ado, let's get Mark Stiegler on the horn and let's talk. JM, let's talk hey, about, welcome, Lexi. Let's get Mark Stiegler on and we'll talk about his uh, series. So I've got some questions, and I think they're going to be I good. I think so too, Sheba. If they're not, if they're not, if if they're going to change, you know, what they consider their uh, Dell Dell is in here. Yes, I don't know if he's actively paying attention. Lux. Mark, I told him to tell you to come in here and hang with us because we've got this author coming on, and it's science fiction with real science attached. And I thought you would like it. Well, I have some questions about the science. Well, I mean, some of it is cutting edge. Some of it's not there. It's just an idea. So I don't know where the line is on what all he's come up with for his books. Well, let's go ahead and uh, give him a call and get him on with us. How about that? <laughs> Yay! Yay! All right, call. Ringing. Cha cha. Cha cha. I don't know why that makes me want to say cha cha between the beat. Are you there yet? Yes, we are. Welcome, Mark. How are you today? Thank you. Uh, I'm doing great. <laughs> well, it's nice to finally meet you. Um, I am, I'm Emerald Storm. I'm the one who contacted you, uh, otherwise okay. known as Heather. <laughs> yes, okay. So on the show here, I should call you Emerald. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. So you are master of the brain trust universe is this is this going to be opened up like the other lmvp in universes or? uh well that's you know, that's an interesting question i am open to the idea of opening the universe to other authors uh but uh, uh that really hasn't been discussed yet as a uh, oh, possibility okay. i ask because uh our viewership is used to me talking a lot about um the K michael and the everybody you know, right. several of the others have been on and everything, and, and the, the universes just keep growing and growing. But yes. here you are, kind of over here by yourself, and That's I right. love the stories, but it when everything else has, it has so many other authors involved, it's kind of odd for you're, you're just over here by yourself. <laughs> oh, we've, already got a, we've already got a chat well, question for you. Uh, <laughs> So, so um, as, as far as, yes, being off by myself, uh, 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 Michael Anderley explains uh, how we got together uh, uh, as basically Michael uh, wanted to uh, show that he could steal a trad pub author from the trad <laughs> yeah. pub world. Okay. 
Yeah, because everything you did the before. In the 90s right. was a trad pub author. Right. Uh, I, got, I was a finalist for the Hugo. I got nominated for the Prometheus. Uh, and, uh, you know, I published uh, several books through Bain, uh, which is sort of, you know, the core of, of the trad pub world. So in any event, so uh, he and I met through my wife, who through another funny story I'll skip today, uh, uh, became the boss of his editing staff for the entire LMBPN publishing universe. Uh, and so in any event, so she introduced him to me and uh, he wanted to have a trad pub author. So uh, we cut a deal and here I am. So yeah, my stuff is, is definitely different. You know, it's not, uh, uh, it's not urban fantasy. Mm -mm. Uh, this is hard science fiction, more the kind of thing that you would like. If, if you like Michael Crichton, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're likely to like my stuff. That's ex I, I agree with that sentiment exactly. Um, I've been telling everybody a little bit about Brain Trust. Um, and quite honestly, because I've been in the middle of uh, with like some of the new stuff, you know, that Martha and Sarah have been mm -hmm. putting out the new. I, I totally had put the Brain Trust out of my mind until you come up with. And started posting that you were about to put out the next book. And then I was like, oh, my yeah. God, I totally forgot about the brain trust. And, well, well uh, I, I, I have some good news uh, for both uh, people who are new to the brain trust universe and people who I, I mean, I published my last book on August 22nd. This mm -hmm. is a last one of the, my characteristics as a trad pub author. It takes me uh, much of a year in order to pump out a book. Right. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but uh, but anyway, book four is designed to be something that you can read standalone without having read the first three books, oh. and uh, and it and it has a preface which is a history of the world to get you into up to speed and into the space. Excellent, excellent, and that re that releases on May third. That is correct. It's coming up, uh, I that's guess, true. six days from now. The guys are saying, well, that's still faster than George R.R. R. Martin. So, <laughs> yeah. What's up, Kate? That's right. That's right. You know, I keep on trying to keep in mind that Ayn Rand, when she wrote Atlas Shrug, oh. and that's oh, yeah. another author that people compare me to. Yeah. Um, uh, when she wrote Atlas Shrugged, it took her 14 years. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is a whole different thing. <laughs> Um, so my husband's not so much of a reader, but he is very much into the science and I've explained some of the things that I could remember out of the series of, of the innovations and stuff. And so yes. he has some, he has some questions for you. So my first question is, have you ever heard of Taylor Wilson? Man, you know, I think I've heard the name, but I, I don't recognize it offhand. Uh, Why? So Taylor was a 14-year-old kid who built a nuclear uh, fission reactor oh, in his parents' garage. Yes. Okay. That's okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. See, I, right. if you do hard science, you know this kid. Okay. So he's 19 That's now, right. and he's talking about um, a pretty radical plan for small nuclear fission reactors that Three is cheers. that yeah he's 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 turning it into into fact i know that mm -hmm. uh, heather has explained that some of your uh, some of your books uh kind of go along that same lines and i was wondering if you got the ideas possibly from taylor wilson or or anybody else that potentially is in the science community um well yes um uh i can't actually remember the name of the guy i got the ideas for the uh, uh so, so on the brain trust all the ships are powered by what are referred to as molten salt nuclear reactors. Molten salt nuclear, rea nuclear reactors are actually inherently safe. And as, as, uh, as is demonstrated uh, in one of the books, you can actually uh, give the terrorists the keys to the control room and let them drive a truck bomb onto a molten salt nuclear reactor. And uh, your worst case is uh, losing an area about the size of a football field, okay? These things are very safe. Uh, you can make them small enough so that you can run them off a an assembly line like cans of soup. Uh, 
and uh, so they 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 are they are the real game changer, the thing that you need. They uh, the, the, the you can make them uh, you uh, burn radioactive waste. Yeah, they'll okay. burn what we've already been using in current reactors, right? That's right. That's right. You take stuff out of the existing, you know, everybody's, uh, all the greens are worried about these enormous stockpiles of used nuclear fuel. The truth of the matter is they don't actually take up very much space, but that's okay. I don't care because with a molten salt reactor, uh, you can just throw that into the mix, into the soup in the molten salt and it will burn. Uh, you know, a, a, a normal nuclear reactor, a modern-day nuclear reactor, uh, uses about 2% of the energy stored in a nuclear fuel rod, okay? Only 2%. Right. So so we can do, you know, we can do 50 times better than that, right. uh, and the brain trust does. Yeah, and that's what I'm— So is this, like, actual science, or is this yes. a theory, or— uh, we actually built one back in the 60s. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, the, <laughs> so I need to do some research on molten okay, so, salt nuclear yeah. reactors. Well, the kid the kid talks about it in a TED Talk. Uh, yeah, Taylor Wilson did briefly did the, touch up on it, but it, you know, I haven't done a lot of reading myself on on that particular nuclear reactor, but he's But that uh, was the cl- that was what I thought you were doing with brain trust, and so yeah. I wasn't sure if I was connecting right because you know, there's the brain that trust is, is on ships, guys, outside mm-hmm. of in international waters, so no country can control them. So they can yes. basically do whatever they want. Right. Which means yes. they can actually solve problems. So Exactly. Do you, do exactly. You, do you, in the brain trust universe as a whole, um, you know, uh, not every reader notices this because the sto- most of the story takes place on the brain trust uh, fleet of cruise liners, which is really the bright spot in in human civilization at the time that the story takes place. Mm-hmm. The rest of the uh, world is slumping into this uh, dystopia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Western civilization has been completely conquered by a blend of autocrats and uh, regulatory bureaucrats. Uh, and. And so uh, this is this is the the light of the world, if you will. Uh, Interesting. Out, so, on, out in international waters. Yeah, because basically, you know, you've got all these autocrats and you've got the corporations controlling everything in all the countries. Kind of seems like what it, it is now. Well, it's really where we're heading. Yes, like we're not yes. quite there yet, but. Cause right. This. So, this is a this is uh, the linear version of a dystopia. Basically, if you take uh, the wrong collection of trends in the world of today and you extrapolate them linearly forward, uh, you wind up with the brain trust universe uh, and uh, you know the, the last stand of human innovation is uh, on the brain trust. So, how much research did you do before writing the books? Or during it seems the- like a lot of research is why I'm asking. Because it- y- yes, uh, there's a lot of research in these books, but um, and I do do research just prior to starting a book and in the middle of uh, writing a book, uh, uh, I wind up doing research as well. But the truth of the matter is, a great deal of this is stuff that I know because I have spent 60 years accumulating random odd scientific, political, economic facts. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so all the molten salt reactor stuff that you'll find in book one, I think you'll find book one very interesting if you're interested in nuclear reactor tech. Because I describe it in high levels and in a way that's related to uh, storytelling, but nonetheless, some some real technical truth there. Um, Enough so uh, that I caught on and found Taylor and extrapolated that. So, you know... (laughs) It, right. I could, you know, you got enough in there that it led me down the rabbit hole for sure. Well, current, <laughs> current nuclear tech is extremely, extremely scary. Yeah. Uh, just the entire concept of current nuclear tech scares, the, it scares me. Yeah, uh, oh, well, three mile, you know, because of Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, and you're just yeah. thinking, what if? Always. Well, 
So, so on the one hand, uh, I consider uh, the current generation of nuclear reactors to have been obsolete before they were ever ma manufactured, okay? Wow. Uh, but uh, uh, the flip side of that is, you know, you can't power a modern civilization uh, with solar panels and mm -hmm. wind turbines, none of which work at midnight, right? right. right. The problem with uh, the the you know, the, the Ocasio-Cortez view of the future is there's midnight in winter and you got to have power then. Right. Uh, but uh, so on the one hand, they I understand why why you find them a little bit scary. On the other hand, I have to say I find global warming a bit scarier. One of the things that has happened in the brain trust universe, a part of the background before the story starts, is that uh, West Antarctic ice ice sheet sea broke off uh, from Antarctica, uh, floated to the equator, melted, and Florida, all the populated parts of Florida, were drowned. Uh, and that is, we no longer have the state of Florida. We have the Everglades territories. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. I do. Yeah. Now, that doesn't play very much of a role in <laughs> the story itself, except that the rocket company Space R doesn't have any uh, launch facilities at Kennedy anymore. Right, because it's still uh, underwater. But it has a very direct impact on the characters in book four, uh, some of whom are off the coast of Africa, and uh, in particular off the coast of uh, Nigeria and Benin. And uh, Benin has become a failed state uh, because the uh, ocean rose and drowned the capital and the largest city. And so... Uh, the brain trust has to figure out what to do something with this very unsavory neighbor. Hi, patients. So, do you really think that algae can help the world as much as it does in the brain trust universe? Okay, uh, the answer is yes. Um, now, let's just be clear. One of the one of the funny scenes is the scene where people. Uh, uh, in the cafeteria are eating uh, uh, cooked algae as a part of the meal and they're concluding that it's okay on a, on a BLT sandwich but not for much else. <laughs> uh, so however, however having said that, okay, so th each one of the brain trust uh, archipelagos uh, basically surrounds itself with an artificial reef full of algae and kelp but they use it mainly to breed uh, uh, shrimp, lobster, and kahala. Kahala being a uh, a, a fish uh, that is very uh, uh, very um, uh, domesticatable and makes excellent sushi. Mm -hmm. And but, it's sustainable so. because it's a smaller fish, right? So have you, uh, I, I haven't read your books, Heather has. Uh, did Have you touched on like algae biofuels? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one of the things that the Space R people wind up doing in book two is building a reef that has no archipelago in it so that they can manufacture uh, methane for their rocket ships. Nice. Yeah, so they're using it to produce all that. Right. Yeah, one of the things that has happened in this future is after we lost Florida and after Benin became a failed state, uh, the uh, the world imposed large taxes on uh, on petroleum fuel, and so it's going to uh, it's going to be cost effective for Space R to build their own reef using brain trust technology. And, uh, and and uh, and use the methane from that. Understand that lots of things are cost effective for the brain trust that aren't cost effective today uh, or in the future of the dirt ciders uh, because uh, the brain trust uses general purpose robots with uh, with a very uh, with, with with lots of CPU and opposable thumbs. Whereas, on, whereas the dirt side civilization uh, from America to Japan and everybody in, comp in between has uh, banned general purpose robots because of the fear that it will uh, uh, wipe out all the jobs and leave everybody unemployed. 
So have you touched on the... Which uh, is a very real concern right now, right? So you, Oh, yes, yes. You, it's, you a, said, it's a legitimate concern. Uh, I wish uh, people would uh, address it in a sensible fashion. But Phoenix. that doesn't seem one Phoenix. of the likely outcomes. Okay, hang on, I'm sorry. Oh, no, yeah, Phoenix doesn't know that you are actually affiliated with Michael Anderley. Phoenix, <laughs> the Brain Trust is one of the LMVP and <laughs> minds, darling. <laughs> I guess you haven't met, uh, run across Mark yet. Um, That's right. Phoenix, Welcome. Phoenix, and I met because of Michael. So, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's it's not it's far from being the biggest seller in the universe and of, in the LMBP and world. And of course, it's outside all of their uh, you know their giant universes. It's not yeah. Your third yeah, yeah. This is the. But I love I love the detail and the and you keep nice fast paced adventure. There's not a drag at all with sometimes with real science fiction books, you get this right. lag. Uh, you know, for right. any of you who don't read science fiction, there's this lag sometimes that happens because you get drowned in the science. And right. Mark, you do a great job of just blending it. And yes, thank you. Thank I, you very much. I actually, I would probably I be think happier you, getting drowned in the science, but <laughs> yeah, Nick reads, but he reads. Yeah, I don't. Tech I don't manuals. read novels. I read tech stuff. Uh, you know, I if I want to know how to build a nuclear reactor, I go learn it. Um, you might well enjoy the Brain Trust, even though it is science fiction. I think. I think he would. Uh, he's just not. I'll have to ever give it a go. Been. I've 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 always been the reader that if I'm not actively learning something from it. And it's just entertaining, then it's probably not for me. Yeah. Okay. We're just opposite well, readers, and it's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait until you see all the different ways they use graphene on the brain trust. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you mentioned methanol from the algae. Uh, what about ethanol? Um, it's it's irrelevant. Uh, I mean, they import all of their whiskey from the dirt side, right? Uh, there are a number of things that the I, I the, the brain trust is 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 involved in the world economic ecosystem. Uh, so they import whiskey, they import uh, beef. Yeah, they're still they trying wheat. to participate, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So you and, know. The, and there's more than one reason for doing that. Uh, one of the things they want to do is they want to co-opt all of the uh, dirt side uh, nations that 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 have various reasons for wanting to destroy them. And they want to make sure that those nations have a reason to keep the brain trust alive. So the American president for life uh, uh, is reluctant to uh, do serious damage to the brain trust because the wheat and beef lobbies are so, so enthusiastic about continuing to sell to the brain trust. Yeah. They're basically they're they stay loud enough that it, if anything happens to them, someone will Someone's step in. And there is yes. part of that action in the books. I'm not going to let so, in. So I don't want to give there. it away, but there is that political yes. side does show up. They're not out there in the middle of the ocean being secretive. No. Okay. Well, yes uh, they're, and they're, yes they're and no. They're very much the opposite of secretive. Okay. Well, uh, they invent things and they promulgate them to the world. They At just, least the things that the world is willing to allow them to send to accept, them. yeah, uh, yeah. Because many of the things that the brain trust invents are illegal. Yeah, like like the which the is why they're out in international general market. purpose robots and stuff. Yeah. Yes. Right. Exactly. Exactly. S speaking of robots, one of our uh, viewers had a question a moment ago about your thoughts on uh, artificial intelligence. The future of AI. The future of AI. Ah. Well, okay, so the guy I know who has the most interesting view on this is, uh, 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 I guess I'll call him a friend, Ray Kurzweil, uh, who has been studying the exponential uh, growth in technology, uh, and he, he, he draws these charts which, which uh, show that we've been on an exponential technological curve for tens of thousands of years. Now understand that in an exponential curve, you know, the opening parts are really low and really slow, but then you hit this, what's called the, uh, the, 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 the hockey stick part, and it starts taking off. According to him, he's figuring that artificial intelligence will, will be seeing uh, AIs that are as smart as human beings by 2050. And of course, since uh, uh, 
the power of computers doubles every two years. You know, by the year 2060, you're looking at a universe where an unaugmented human being simply is is simply one of the guys uh, watching civilization cruise by. Uh, so anyway, so that's his view of it. Uh, one of the big questions is how do we uh, bring ethics and morality to computers? And uh, I can't even get talk started on that topic. I've had more than one. I, you know, this is a topic that that I and, and other people fiddling in this field like Robin Hansen argue about from time to time. Uh, but uh, one, one of the solutions, as I sort of implied there, is for us to become more enhanced. One of the things that, uh, uh, that has enhanced us immensely is the World Wide Web. Okay? When, I, when I wrote science fiction back in the 80s and the 90s, I did research then, too, but it was painful. I remember making a trip to the uh, Library of Congress in Washington, oh, D.C. Wow. once to, uh, to investigate a number of things for science fiction novel. Well, today, you know, wh what I do is I come to a place where I need to know the truth about some particular technology, a little bit more detail. And, you know, I just flip open a, a, a page on the browser next to my editor and, uh, you know, I ask the question, I get the answer, and I, and I do something with it. So I'm, you know, I'm orders of magnitude more powerful as a science fiction author today than I was 20 years ago. You know, we keep telling the kids that stuff. You, our kids will come and be, like, asking questions. Dude, in your, in your hand, all the answers are right there. They're right there. <laughs> Uh, that's right. One, one, Google. One, one friend of mine uh, has observed that uh, the web is almost like a magic genie in that <laughs> if, you if you come up with a question that you need answered, you know, out of the billion other people who are uh, working on the web, probably somebody else has already asked that question and exactly. somebody else has already answered it. So the, so the answer is just waiting for you to pick it up. Now, I confess that I myself ask questions that are sufficiently exotic that no one else has asked them before. But. Well, yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, I have a tendency not to use my computer to look up how to do certain things. I'll actually go ask police officers because I feel better talking to a police officer that knows I write. <laughs> rather, rather than just throwing your question out on the internet and then, you know, maybe it being and, tagged <laughs> as, and, as and there, potential and, and there, threat. <laughs> yeah, and there are lots of things that you cannot find on the internet, uh, particularly uh, politically incorrect things. Can, uh, facts can be hard to track down sometimes because uh, the, they uh, want to bury uh, those tr bury yeah. those things, and they shouldn't. We need all the truth there. But yeah, yeah. but. But there's a there's a scene in book four, Ode to Defiance, the new one coming out on May three. There's a scene wherein I'm uh, making some statements about uh, uh, the Senegalese culture in uh, Western Africa, and these statements are true, uh, but I could not find them anywhere on the web. Uh, and the only reason I'm confident they're true is that they were told to me by a retired Peace Corps worker. And oh, it's wow. just never been documented to the yeah, point just never that been it's documented. accessible as public data. Wow. Yeah. So. And that's, you know, for, is, for every million gigabytes we saved, there's probably hundreds of millions lost <laughs> that nobody ever. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever used that. the dark web as a resource? So my uh, uh, so I uh, I spent ten years working in computer security as a uh, research scientist. Oh dear. Uh, and <laughs> okay, you're this... you're going to be the first author that Nick really connects with. My husband is a software programmer and has done security and everything. <laughs> Oh, okay. Then, then let me tell you the particular story that you should read. There's a I have a novelette in the Brain Trust universe. So this is a real quick read, a uh, very easy introduction. And it's all about uh, this 12-year-old boy who, is, who lives on the Brain Trust, who is uh, uh, doing his homework in cybersecurity. And of course, on the, way, on the Brain Trust, the way you teach somebody 
uh, how to secure yourself from com from uh, from computer attacks is by first teaching them how to engage in computer attacks. Right. So this kid winds up, uh, for various reasons, uh, uh, penetrating the entire backup database for the state of California, <laughs> finds some very important information, uh, and that's the beginning of the story. Yeah. Yeah, so... so okay. And, and, okay. And the depiction of how he gets it is you'll recognize it as being absolutely true. Yeah. So. Awesome. Okay, somebody asked if all the books were on uh, audio. Um, I see book one on Audible. Are, are all yes, of them on all Audible? Three, all three of the novels <laughs> are available Genial. in Audible. Uh, the book coming out on May 3rd uh, is not available on Audible yet, but we're we are lining up uh, the same narrator who did the first three, who is wonderful, uh, and she'll be narrating the fourth book. Uh, the uh, uh, the short the novelette was actually uh, uh, was actually written for and was narrated for uh, the LMBPN Ear Crush podcast site. Uh -huh. So that's available as well. Nice. Uh, yeah, LMBPN does have quite a few podcasts going on, in case you guys didn't know. Other than Sarah's, their L has one going on. Um, Craig and uh, Michael have a series they've got going on. So they're getting, they're really picking up and doing all kinds of interesting things now throughout the, all across all the different universes. Everyone does, Phoenix? Uh, uh, to answer your question, <laughs> to answer your question, Patience, yes, I am. <laughs> the, patience uh, asked if I was a sugar monster. Yeah, I, I, eat, I eat a uh, lot of sugar. Okay. Yeah. Your brain requires it. <laughs> That's right. So, you said book four is, is sent to be standalone. If you don't read the other three first, you're still okay just oh, picking up book four. Yes. yes. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a good place to start because it is, well, for one thing, I think it's going to uh, appeal to a, a larger audience, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of one of the reasons we tried to make it uh, standalone. But it's, uh, uh, it's faster paced. Uh, it's a big book at 124,000 words. Holy it's faster crap. paced. That's a huge book for LMBPN. Yes, it is a huge book. And, uh, and I, you know, when I when I went to do the second book, it wound up being that size as well. But that the second book, I split into two books. Right. So books two and three okay. were originally a single book. And I said, well, you know, you got to fix this in the world of Kindle, digital, indie publishing. Uh Books are supposed to be like 60, 70 K long. So right. I figured out a way to split it. But this book, uh, there's no place to split it in the middle. And in the middle of this book, the, the, the uh, bad guys are wiping the floor with the good guys. And oh, you just can't stop. Yeah, you can't just stop. stop. Don't stop. leave cliffhangers. God, no, and don't mm -hmm. kill a dog. I tell yeah. you what. <laughs> Right. Michael's the only author I ever saw that has gotten away with that, and John Wick is the only movie I've seen that's gotten away with it. Um, everybody is still pissed at George R. R. Martin for killing the dire wolves, so, you know, it is what yeah. it is. <laughs> John yeah. Snow will prevail. Yeah. Um, well, so, in, it, in any event, book four is just stuffed to the gills with uh, secrets, clues, and hidden agendas. Uh, it's a, a very Michael Crichton like. As so, are you guys? Um, LMBP is what? pretty notorious with like having running an arc for four books, and then so it sounds like you've run your arc for four books, but your fourth book is more than the ending of an arc. It's more of a segue into the second arc of your stories. Is that what is that what's going on here? Um, well, uh, no, that's not really what's going on. What I actually have here is what my wife likes to refer to as a five book trilogy. <laughs> uh, nice. So, so as I said earlier, the second and the third books, uh, <laughs> were supposed to be a single book, you right. know, and so it was going to be the first book, the second book and the third book. 
uh, the third book, what was then figured to be the third book is now the fifth book. Uh, the second book had three different subplots. Uh, and, oh, yeah. you know, I, I had forgotten how subplots tend to expand in the 20 years since the last time I'd written a book. I and so, uh, so I got started and I quickly found that I could not do all three subplots. And I immediately you, uh, pushed the third subplot off to another book, and that's Ode to Defiance, the one that's coming out on May 3rd. But then, the, you know, the first subplot kept on expanding, and so eventually I had books two and three. And book four is twice as long as a normal book and would have been split had there been a way of splitting it. So it almost wound up being a six-book trilogy. Wow. Wow. Uh, so there are... Uh... A lot of the chat is running out and checking out the uh, Amazon description. And one of the things that stood out to me, uh, first line of the book, one of the books, if you really like Donald Trump, do not read this book. Uh, and it's kind of so true. That it, the, conservative, <laughs> the conservative view is not going to work with this book series. Not if you are on the hard, if you're in that hard line conservative series, it's not going to work. Because you have to have an open enough mind to accept robots and stuff like that. Right? Well, okay, let, 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 let me speak to this in, in, Thanks, in a Josh. more mellow way. First of all, the, 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 the line that you found there is actually obsolete, and we discarded that one uh, over a year ago, so I have no idea where you managed to find that one, but we're trying oh. to kill it. Uh, <laughs> the, new, the, the, the new headline is uh, Political Satire Included, Sense of Humor Required. Yes, and that one is, is much truer. Okay, I have a I have fans who are Trump supporters who enjoy the book a great deal. Craig Martell. Okay. Yes, Craig's uh, been on here. Uh, everybody's met Craig Martell. Yeah, everybody's so. met Craig. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Craig Craig read the third book. Okay. Now, of all four of these books, the worst one to start with is book three because it's the second half of book two. Right. 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 <laughs> okay. Okay, so it's the worst possible book to read, but he really liked it. Uh, he is a is a Trump supporter. Uh, he really enjoyed it. But the important point here is uh, you have to be willing to look at the politicians of today and remember one fact that we all knew 10 years ago. And the one fact is the answer to the following question uh, how do you know that a politician is lying? Yeah, his be, lips because, are moving. Because they're a politician. <laughs> his lips are moving. <laughs> um, his lips are moving. Okay. We used to all know that. So anyway, so whatever your uh, political Welcome, perspective is, if you, you appreciate the fact that it's reasonable to make fun of politicians, then you will enjoy these books. But if you're either so far left or so far right that you just don't have any sense of humor left anymore, yeah. do not read these books. Yeah. Well, don't read any book by any LMBPN author if that's the case. That's <laughs> that's all I can tell you. Um, and, to Spotify, and, I am Emerald Storm. Nice to meet you. That's my wife. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I was getting asked who I was. So <laughs> I have to... Um, no, every book that up, Jason? Ev everything that I've ever Long, read that, that Michael has brought through LNBP and so far, it, everything. If you don't have a sense of humor, don't read it. You know, right. it's just right. you know, if you can't handle g gutter humor, if you can't handle <laughs> dark humor, if you can't handle oh, who is sex that? humor, you know, then these are not any of the books for you. Wait, who is who is that that uh, had the complaint that they said fuck too much? And, and then, then Michael doubled, turned around, Michael doubled around, down yeah, on how Michael many fucks Turner. he put in the book. Yeah, yep. I, it was somebody. We doubled it. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Th th this <coughs> makes me think of uh, the story of Joss Whedon. Uh, some very famous critic complained that Joss Whedon, uh, uh, with Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, was a was a lousy script writer, except that he had all these brilliant dialogues. Uh, and so anyway, so that it was the thing that inspired Joss Whedon to write the episode Hush, in which everybody's vocal cords are shut off and there's no dialogue in the entire story. Mm. <laughs> uh, 
but uh, but in any event, just just to be clear about something for all of your uh, listeners, uh, although the Carthurian Gambit, all these universes, uh, you know, have uh, all those different kinds of humor you were just describing. Uh, these books are kind of frighteningly clean. There isn't they a really lot. They really are. Of, uh, You're right. I, I really, they, the, the tone that you're used to with, especially like any KGU book, any KGU, any well, yeah. uh, <laughs> Martha's book. Uh, you know, she's got a troll named Yum Fuck. So you know, these yeah. are these are actually something I could totally recommend for your young adult section too. Um, yes, that's right. We, yeah, we, we've actually the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the short story about the 12-year-old actually just completely out of the blue got a yellow tag in, a, in the young adult uh, section. Excellent. Nice. And if you guys don't know what a yellow tag is on Amazon, it's a bestseller tag. Yeah. Sorry, that's our whistle puppy. <laughs> yeah, wh whistle puppy wants attention. Come on. Uh, the... Uh, how much? Okay, so you've got this this one coming. What are we, what are we looking for as future? How much more are we going to see of Brain Trust? Now, Thank I know you, you said you didn't have it. You're you're not. Um, what is the word I want? Um, you're not opposed to having others authors in your universe. So yeah. you have an open mind about that. But aside from that, just for your vision, how what the, are we the, looking at? The current plan is one more book, the fifth book beyond this one. Okay. And uh, the universe at the end of the fifth book is uh, uh, so, is, is changing so radically, uh, so rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the big uh, plot themes that were initiated in book one uh, all get wrapped up. Uh, I mean, there are even uh, plot strands that you would never realize were plot strands from book one that oh. actually get resolved in in the fifth oh. book. There's a there's I'm a excited. there's a there's a there's a yellow piece of paper covered with equations uh, uh, in a frame uh, hanging outside the main character's office. Yes, uh, which is introduced in the first book. Uh -huh. uh, so we're going to mention in the second book and disappears. Well, it plays a key role at the end of uh, the fifth book. Yay! Okay, I did <laughs> wonder about that one. I did. Um, cuz I like the I love the little detail stuff and how things sneak back in. And mm -hmm. um, so I had wondered about that whether that was going to be like was it just kind of a thing, or is it going to really be a thing? So I'm excited to hear that it's going to really be a thing. Um, yes, one, one, one of the guys who wrote a review for uh, uh, the second book said, uh, I just hope you don't forget the truck driver in the future books, because I, I introduced this truck driver in the second book who gets really shafted by the state of California and he's left. Oh uh, yeah, that poor guy sitting on the dock then loses his truck. Yes, oh yes. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I have good news. Uh, good things happen with him in book oh, four. Okay. Okay. <laughs> good. Yeah, I, what I really love also about the stories are the hope, because you're using real science. And, and so that's, you know, it gives you hope the science is there. If we can just all stop being assholes, mm -hmm. <laughs> then, you know, yes. that this these things are really exist. We could really do something. That's and, right. That's right. And so the hope is there with what you've written, and it's just beautiful. So thank you so much. Well, I'm, thank you. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to the, next, to the one coming out. It comes out on our, our wedding anniversary, so... Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. So I have a gift request yeah, that, here. That was a hint. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he understood how long have you been married. So, you know, this will be our 17th wedding anniversary. <laughs> it's been a ride. <laughs> but so are you working on any other book series? Because, uh, you know, well, you left off many years ago and you quit writing so yeah I, 
I wound up being a, uh, a, a research scientist, actually a visiting scholar at HP Labs. And uh, so all of my writing time went into writing academic papers. So that uh, blew um, a big hole in my, uh, just... in my uh, professional science fiction career. Uh, but, but I've retired from that now, and it's time to go back into else. it. Yeah. Uh, as, as far as writing other things, I have, uh, uh, you know, my head is full of the Brain Trust universe. It's really hard for me to think about much else. I've got at least uh, 10 different characters loaded in my head at any given, given moment making jokes about the real world in my head. It probably drives my wife crazy. Um, <laughs> I understand and, completely. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I did get contacted by a uh, group who's doing a study for the United States military. And a couple of my books have been used by, the, uh, by, by people for odd reasons. The, uh, one of my early books, David Sling, was actually used at, uh, in a course either at West Point or the U.S. Air Force Academy. I'm Holy not quite sure which one anymore. Wow. But it was used uh, as to, to teach uh, people about <laughs> military procurement uh, and uh, uh, how not to do uh, software development. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something and, you've written um, some of, let's see. Well, so, in, so, so in any event, uh, a group of guys <laughs> doing, uh, who, who, uh, who, are, who are doing a thing for the Joint Chiefs of Staff on recommendations on how to do software development in the future uh, recently asked me to write some uh, short story vignettes uh, about, about what happens if if the military does or does not do software the right way in the future. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> and so now, so so now some, you need to present, uh, are, we're to the point that we're presenting things to the Joint Chiefs of Staff as short stories? Holy shit. Well, understand <laughs> that, the, that, these, that, these, that these write-ups, these official write-ups, tend to be really thick tomes that are better for putting people to sleep right. than they are for anything else, okay? Uh, and so they were looking for some short vignettes to liven it up, and basically these are uh, uh, parables. Right. Uh, that's, right. that's really the right word for these, parables on do it the right way or... You know, else. you know they have visual graphics engines. There's <laughs> one called RenPy, and, you know, you could use that to you know make them where they can have a choose your own adventure story with it no adventure stories are hard to write <laughs> uh, i'm sorry when i <laughs> you know i i worked for um the chickasaw nation tribal government for about a decade and uh, they asked me to write cool. up a paper on how to secure uh their desktop environment and ah. uh, the only thing that I could come up with was unplug it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, that's all, right. I mean, literally, that's I was right. just, I, they wrote me an, e you know, uh, I, I got an email and they were like, you know, can you write this up? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I can, I can fill your head full of crap or I can just tell you the truth. Just unplug it. There's only, the one, only there's only one answer. way. You're they, absolutely they, right. They, uh, they didn't back want... in the days when I used to do presentations on computer security, uh, one of the opening slides in many of my presentations uh, was a slide of a desktop PC with an Ethernet cable and a pair of wire cutters that had just cut the Ethernet cable making the point that this is the way to make your computer really secure. Uh, but the problem with that is that we don't actually want security. What we want is secure cooperation. And then I go on and talk about how the appropriate technologies can be used to enable secure cooperation, although, of course, none of those uh, uh, technologies are the ones that are actually used today. You know, you've been in with securities long enough. We have a character who joins us every so often here on the pig stand called C Captain Zap. Do you happen to know Ian okay. Murphy? Have you ever heard of Ian Murphy? No, I've never heard of Captain Zap. Really? Captain nope. Zap is the uh, uh, the first 
uh, hacker to ever be arrested for a felony computer crime. Um, Although technically it wasn't a computer crime because it was 1981. There were no laws at the time. Are are you sure you're not talking about Captain Crunch? No, no, no. no. Zap. It's Zap. It's not Crunch. I know what you're talking about. I know who Captain Crunch is, too. Captain Captain Crunch has to do with the Crunch. I I never met Captain Crunch. Well, Ian Ian Murphy. Ian Murphy. Uh, He was actually on the uh, Good Morning America at one point. uh, Talking about internet security. Talking about about computer security. Computer security. Now, this was back in the 80s. Yeah. So I thought maybe you might have run across each other. I know We do know who Captain Crunch is. We've never... I've never actually talked to him, but his has to do mm-hmm. with changing using the whistle. Yes, that's what he that's did. Right. Now, so Captain Zap, uh, he's the one who he, changed the time clocks at eight. He changed the yeah. He changed the uh, the daytime rates to nighttime rates, and the nighttime rates to daytime rates at AT and T. Right, right, uh, right, right. Which caused mass confusion because at the time, nighttime you got like a yeah, discounted I, rate. It was an enormous cost change. Yeah. Was it? Okay. Yeah, we it were, was. He was responsible I for that. I don't really remember. I, I, What's I up, know man? it. I, I remember having to pay long distance back in the day. I remember my mom complaining. <laughs> but I don't remember. Yeah. Oh, my parents know, really complained. Believe. My parents really yeah. complained because. You were in pre, England. <laughs> well, pre-internet, um, I was connecting to BBSs. I and you were dialing. They were all, I was dialing oh long distance for every God. single one of them. Yeah, I got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. The old Wildcat software. Oh, well. So, yeah, we like we do a lot of IT stuff and and uh, bulletin, just everything on, systems, here on our show. Sure. So it's a little bit of everything all the time. And right. I love right. I, I didn't know that you had the the securities background. Um I totally missed that in reading about you. Um, I also used to build tactical nuclear targeting programs, and I spent one year making my money by writing millions of uh, bad checks. Wow. Man, that makes my CRM programming look um, weak. Were you signing government checks? <laughs> were you signing checks for the government? Is that what was no, that? No, no, people were paying me to write bad checks. <laughs> <laughs> Then there were the three years when, when it, for three years, reliably every year, somebody paid me to write a virus for them. It was rather bizarre. Wow. Uh, and uh, so I invent. So I have a, I have a, a, an amusing background. That is interesting. Oh wow. Well, you know, but, you have lots of computers, lots of the computer history and internet history stored away. We're gonna have to yeah. bring you back we'll just to, bring to talk you back about just that, to talk about some, that. Not, sometime because we're gonna do. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm 40 That's years. Fine. I'm 40 That's years fine. old, and a lot of our viewers are 20, 20s and younger, mm-hmm. and they've never mm-hmm. known a life without the internet. And so, right. we. And, you know, I try to, I try to talk about coupler modems and like 300 baud, and they just they, a lot a lot it of these 20 years, they can't wrap their head around that speed. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. So we enjoy so. teaching them the history and the understanding. Um, we're gonna. Right. I'm. I've got Anna Boog. I'm talking with her about coming mm-hmm. on. She was the first one of the first cam girls, which essentially is what we do right here now. She was, mm-hmm. you know, one of the first. Well, millions she had her, right. of people watched her. She had her entire house right. wired up. And so I've known her because I was one of the first internet radio DJs. So I knew her Ah. from way back then, and Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we've been teaching all the internet history and everything, and, but we have kids, too. Our youngest is 15, and our oldest is 23, and so it it just kind of plays into what we're teaching them a lot of times, too. (laughs) Yes. But... Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I really please, appreciate Please it. do come back so we can go over the history of the yeah. internet. Yes. And teach, teach some kids something. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, b- before we break, uh, sure. I, I have an offer for you. If we've got to hang up, that's fine. But one of the things that I have here is for book four, I have uh, uh, sort of the li- uh, literary version of a trailer which is a set of five of the punchlines that have no, uh, uh, that don't give away any of the plot, uh, but are good punchlines even without any context. If you would like, I would be happy to read them for you. Oh, please do. Yes, please. Okay, fine. 
So these are just punchlines with no context. <clears throat> she now understood how Jam felt when the shark bit her dress. <laughs> Guys, this sounds like quotes you guys keep pulling in from us. <laughs> when a fool has money, you have to hurry to be the one who parts them. <laughs> he missed her already. It was a shame he hadn't managed to kill her. <laughs> that sounds like our marriage. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, it must be tough to be in charge when you have so little control. Oh, wow. Ouch. Wow. <laughs> That's cutting. <laughs> and last but not least, this is the line that starts the crisis uh, in the middle of the book. Uh, and I don't know that the action ever actually slows down after this. If we are very lucky, no one will die except all of us. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Okay. So anyway, so there you have it. That's a little wow. bit of a teaser about uh, O2 Defiance. Right? That was dark, wasn't it? <laughs> they're, they're commenting on that. You guys are crazy. So. <laughs> thank well, you so Mark, much. Mark, thank you so much I am for so joining us. to read it. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. You have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.